welcome to the Monsters of Madness and Magic podcast. I'm Justin, joined by my co-host Angelique. Say hello, Angelique. Hello. This evening we're joined by a very special guest, Academy Award winning screenwriter, producer, and director, Mr. Tom Shulman. Tom, how the hell are you? I'm good. How about you? Doing good, man. It's good to have good. you. Thank you. Good to be here. Where are you? We're in. Physically. I'm in South Carolina. Angelique is in Georgia. I see. Okay. I'm from Tennessee, so we got that corner covered. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So I guess we can start at the beginning here. It's pretty known that well known that Dead Poet Society is semi autobiographical. Uh, take us to the early years. Did you do a lot of the did you have a love of reading, writing, film from an early age? How was your creativity cultivated, would you say? Uh, I would say all of the above, but mostly re mostly reading and film, you know, and uh, I mean, I was a, a film lover in college and my, I think, senior year in college, I was given the option to either uh, write a term paper or make a, a film about one of the books we were reading. So we, a bunch of us got together and made films. I think the whole class made, made films. <laughs> and uh, I, I just fell in love with the process right there. And that was, that was it. Do you remember the first screenplay you ever wrote? I do. It was, uh, it was terrible, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, uh, 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 I think it was about a, uh, a, a deaf guy trying to make music. And it was truly bad, just just embarrassing. But uh, you know, you got to start somewhere. So exactly, maybe it's something yeah. to revisit now that you've had yeah. time to marinate yeah. on it. Yeah, you know? yeah. I wrote that in college, and it was you know just. But uh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, you reminded me of that. It's okay. I'll, yeah, I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. Take us uh, through the day that you sold Dead Poet Society. Now, what was going through your head, and what were those initial conversations like? uh you mean on that day or yeah when you I mean, when you got the news that your script had a uh, well it was a, it was an interesting day because um a few days earlier i had gone to fire my agent because i had another script dead poet society at that point had been circulating maybe for a year uh no one had really picked it up and it seemed basically dead and um and but I had written another script called Love at Second Sight about a psychic detective agency. And that I went to fire my agent because I, he hadn't gotten back to me on that script. And he said to me, oh, I, I didn't get back to you, but there's a producer that's interested in it. And I think there's going to be a bidding war on it this afternoon. So come back to my office this afternoon and we'll see what happens. So I went back to his office and indeed there was a bidding war and it sold that afternoon. And then Later on that evening, he called me and said, you're not going to believe it, but Disney wants to buy Dead Poets Society, and we're going to make the deal tonight. So he called me at midnight and said, we made that deal. So it's quite a day. <laughs> hey, two, wow. two for one. Yeah, two for one day, you know, so you kind of go from zero to semi-hero in, in, in a couple hours. So. so how long was the process of uh, from when you wrote the script to when you sold it? I think I wrote it in 85 and sold it in 87, mm, okay. which in, you know, Hollywood terms is pretty, pretty fast these days, yeah. you know, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So are you an outliner? Uh, more or less. I, I do a sort of different kind of outline. I, I, when I start working on a project, I'll just make a lot of notes, you know, and I'll, I sort of go out of order. I mean, I'll wake up and go, oh, this scene needs this, and I should have a scene about that, and so forth and so on. So I'll just throw those notes into the computer uh, in, a, in a file with that, that project's name on it. When that file gets to be about 30, 40, 50 pages, and I, I'm really feeling that I got a beginning, middle, and an end, I, I clean those notes up. I put them in, you know, I put spaces between every idea. I print them all out. I slice those ideas up into strips and paragraphs. Sometimes the, the, a note will be a page long, whatever, and put it in a pile next to me, clear off everything on the floor around me and start putting them down in order, you know, and on the floor. And, and that process, you know, there are a lot of things missing still at that point, but the process right. of kind of putting something down that feels like it might be the opening and then putting something down that might be three scenes later and asking myself, gee, I don't know how I'm going to get from A to A to C here, but no, nah, well, don't worry about it. Cause I got this whole other pile of stuff to worry about. And while I'm putting that other stuff down, suddenly it will, the Eureka effect will happen, you know, and it'll dawn right. on me. Oh, I know what to do. 
scenes one and three and you know that's solved so it's the process itself i think helps me yeah. solve the problem and so when that's all done I, I put those strips on pieces of eight by ten uh paper and i tape them to the paper and i three hole punch them and i put them in a in a notebook and set it on the desk next to me and that is essentially the the outline or guide for writing the script a very manual process very manual process <laughs> and every time every, every time i i've i try to you know sidestep that process because it's so laborious but I, I I noticed that the screenplays are just better when I do it that way. So I do it. If it works, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know exactly. But it's exactly. a pain in the it's a pain in the ass. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so. so you mentioned in school that you chose to do a film. Or I guess my question is, why did you initially pursue screenwriting instead of directing? It's I initially pursued directing, and gotcha, when gotcha. I. Yeah, when I got out here, you know, I mean, I remember when I got my first agent based on a screen. I mean, first of all, people said, if you don't have some kind of leverage, at least a screenplay you want to direct or something like that, or a book you've bought, which I couldn't afford to do, um, or a play, something, you know, you're, you're, it's going to be a very difficult road to go. So write something, get a hold of something that you want to direct. So when I got through writing my first screenplay and got an agent from it, not that other one that I told you about, but the first screenplay I wrote when I got to Hollywood. Um, the, I t went to meet the agent who liked the script and said, you know, we want to represent you. And I said, you know, what I really want to do is direct. And she said, oh, really? And I said, yeah. And she goes, go look at that behind that potted plant in the corner. I'm like, what? She goes, look at the potted plant. So I go and I walk and there's a potted plant in the corner and behind it is a little taped on the wall is a, or, is a little cartoon and it's two monkeys in a zoo and they're throwing their feces at the at the the uh, uh, uh the spectators in, in the zoo and one of them says to the other you know what i really want to do is direct <laughs> and so the agent said to me that's basically what we think of your chances of directing at this point you're too young and you know establish yourself as a screenwriter and then you know the directing will come so that was you know basically embarking on a whole new career because i did not have any desire to, to write but that there 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 it went so <laughs> i think it worked out <laughs> yeah it worked out but it wasn't it was not what i wanted to do but you know who gets to do what they want to do so yeah so when you start having these meetings with the studios uh, was there ever a point where they wanted to maybe try to replace you as the writer or did you have any input on the director or oh, you know, what's yeah, going yeah. on back there well, the first things that first things that I sold were actually scripts that I wrote as features, or I thought they were features, but ended up getting made as movies of the week for television. And uh, so the the first one that I wrote, um, the network wouldn't even approve me to do a rewrite on it. They just said, you know, this is it. You we got to sell it to us, and somebody else is going to do the next draft. So they said, unless you have something to show us that can prove you can do, do better. And I said, well, I've written something else. So I showed them that and they said, no, thanks. So they hired another writer to write that, that script. And then they called me and said, you know, we'd like to buy the script that you gave us as the writing sample. And I said, what? And they said, and, and we will approve you to rewrite it. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? You know, this is so ridiculous. So I, okay. So I sold them that and, uh, went and got their notes, did the rewrite. And when I turned the rewrite in, I walked into their office and handed it to them. And this is the old days. They said, we are obligated by Writers Guild rules to tell you that we've hired another writer to write. And I said, you're not <laughs> gonna even read it? And they go, probably not. And I said, wow. So then they said, well, uh, you know, my agent got really upset with this. And so he called them and said, what's the problem? Why wouldn't you let him, you know, why don't you, and they said, well, we don't think Tom's writing has enough humanity. So he said, geez, I, well, he's written this script, Dead Poets Society. We want you to read that. So he sent that to them and they called and said, okay, we want to buy that and make it and he can rewrite it. And I said, you know what? Go to hell. You're not making this at the network. <laughs> so that was that. And then of course it took two years to sell it, but at least, uh, did make that decision but so i did go through you know that that process and uh but by the time dead poet they bought that they didn't want to hire anybody to rewrite it and uh i don't think i was rewritten until medicine man mm, okay 
From so Warehouse. When did the, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Angelique. Did you have something? No, I was just saying, wow, that's oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's an, everybody has that kind of journey, I think. Although some people maybe it right. can be worse. So. <clears throat> so when was when was Peter Weir brought on board? I, to my knowledge, you guys went through a couple of directors before he was finally settled upon. Yeah, yeah. The the first director um, tried to get Robin Williams to do the movie, and Robin was interested in doing it, but he, for bizarre reasons, wouldn't approve the director. So. Um, and they actually shot. They they were Studio Disney was convinced that that Robin would would eventually say yes. So they prepped the whole production and they started shooting. And Robin didn't show up the day he was supposed to on on the schedule. So they canceled the shoot. And uh, they gave the director ten days to try to set it up somewhere else without Robin and you know a couple other actors that no one had heard of at the time. So that failed, and so Disney got it back. And they hired uh, Dustin Hoffman to star and direct. And that lasted for about, mm, I guess, six months. He did, and he was going off to do Rain Man and we had, it was committed to direct Dead Poets right after that. But that would have put him shooting the movie in late December. And they basically said, you know, it's a, we got to have fall foliage, et cetera. So you got to shoot some of it at least November. And he, played chicken with them and said no and you know he told me that they're not going to fire me there you know, and they did and they called me right the day they fired him and said he's gone and we've got peter weir and robin williams is in with him going to do it with him so okay <laughs> that's that's a for you know good turn of events i guess so uh dustin's a great guy but but uh you know robin was more the off the shelf and of course peter weir was just a brilliant director so of course yeah i've heard you say before that um disney actually burned the sets and i they did they did I the director, ask, is that common was that just that? no no <laughs> no no i mean i think the, the director was told uh we're canceling the production burn this don't pay to have the sets shipped across country burn have them burned and then come home and he just found that such a odd and offensive thing that he had the cameraman go down and they found the kilns where the, the the sets were being burned and they shot the the fire the the sets going up on fire and he called disney and said we have some dailies from the first day shoot and they're like what and they called me and said they're apparently some dailies." so i you i said sure so i went in and it was just the sets being burned <laughs> that's crazy i wonder why they I, made that decision you know i just saved money oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's usually what it comes so, down to absolutely always yeah. So there's so much emotion packed into Dead Poet Society. Um, extremely powerful scenes. As you're writing the script yourself, um, are you working through or conscious of these emotions as well? And do the same scenes that strike us in the film strike you in the script? I, I think so. I mean, I, by the you know the outlining process to me kind of was the writing. You know, I, it was so detailed in that strip thing that I do that by the time I was actually putting the scenes together, it was almost more like, you know, cutting and pasting and rewriting. So, um, but a few days after I wrote the, and, and the scenes in conceptually felt powerful to me, you know? And so, yes, I was having the same emotions that I think the audience was having. And that's the ideal, because a lot of times you write things and you give it to people and you think you've written something really funny or something really moving and people are like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's disconcerting to have that disconnect between your feelings and the feelings of your readers or audience, but it happens, you know? And then you have to sort of dig in and find out why, what, 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 am, <laughs> what am I seeing that they're not seeing? Or, right. So if you had to put a percentage number wise on it, how much of these characters are uh, some of your own friends or people you've grown up with? Well, they were not all together in one place, but I would say every character was, you know, once I figured out what the function of each character was going to be in the film, then I started looking around and going, okay, I know who this guy would be. And I found a person from my life who would, I could cast in that part. For the writing of it and I do that with every script you know to, to the degree that I can sometimes you can't find somebody you know right but uh <laughs> Bob and what about Bob I couldn't 
you know, I, I had a friend who was somewhat, you know, that that sort of uh, hypochondriacal, but not, <laughs> not not that <laughs> that <laughs> not, so. Uh, but yeah, I, so to that extent, it's completely autobiographical, you know. But there's no there the plot never happened, you know that 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 story never happened. Right. So who, <laughs> which character do you most identify with? Todd. Which one's you? Todd. Todd. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah I figured yeah. so. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, to some extent that writing that movie was my journey out of my own shyness. Oh, I, I could see that. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Were there any parts of the script that you had to surrender or cut due to the studio that you kind of regret or have any? Nothing? No. Mm -mm, mm -mm, no. I mean, Peter Weir had t total control over what was going to be in the movie. We had a couple of discussions about a couple of scenes and then, you know, he, he won those discussions for good reason, not not because, I mean, he said to me, I'm not going to ever make you cut anything or, you know, make changes that you don't want to make. So um, he said, if, if it's, if we disagree vehemently enough, I won't make the movie. <laughs> right. Well, that, that's not so, but we did finally come to, to, you know, agree on everything. That's a, that's a great relationship to have with the director. It really is. Truly. Yeah. Really, really, really lucky in that respect. I've waited almost 20 minutes to tell you that Dead Poet Society is my favorite movie. I was just trying to Oh well thank you. Trying That's... to hold off on it. Okay. Well thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's the most emotionally devastating movie I've ever seen. Wow. <laughs> it absolutely destroys me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think I thought the ending was somehow uplifting, but maybe maybe it's uh it's kind of yeah. bittersweet. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, it is. And uh, like up to this point, when I saw uh, Dead Poet Society, I know Robin Williams had done uh, Good Morning Vietnam, Popeye, Mork and Mindy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But for me, this is the role that catapulted him to the Robin Williams we know today, you know. Right. So while you're there in that moment, can you sense that there's something special going on with this actor in this role? Yes, absolutely. You know, because you, you really, when you're there and you're watching it, you're just trying to throw yourself right into the movie and go is this working or not you know and you just throw, you surrender yourself to it and you know he reached a point where I could feel wow this is you know and especially when we would watch dailies you know uh he was just because there it is on the big screen and Peter Weir would often put a little music under it and it just like you know gave me chills so it was it was great but then you know you you you're the writer and you you know you hope that that you'll feel that way whether the audience is going to feel that way is a whole other <laughs> kind of question. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Peter, you've uh, said like he had some fun and interesting directing techniques and you were there trying to learn how to direct. Yeah. 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 So when you went on to direct uh, past Dead Poet Society, did you take any of his techniques uh, no. to, with you? No, because I didn't understand them. You know, <laughs> I. I... <laughs> probably a good uh, thing then. yeah i mean if i had understood it i would have done it but i didn't i mean he had this he he almost never talked to the actors about anything you know he we we it was cast in a way that he you know he knew those boys were the right people for the for the you know right actors for the parts and then he um but he would often just he would play some music right before he would say action and then cut the music off and then the scene would they would play the scene and I don't even think the actors knew what that was supposed to be doing for them, but, uh, you know, it worked. So, uh, and he would occasionally say, you know, back it off a little or give it a little more here or there, but very rarely it was, he, you know, it was, and we, we had a reading, but no rehearsals. He didn't want to have a reading. I asked him, I said, could we just please have a reading? And he said, okay. So, uh, and I went back to my room that night and rewrote the whole script. And he said, oh, are you out of your mind? <laughs> so, so. so take us mortals through the Oscar process. Did you get a, did you get a, a summons that you were being nominated? And did you, yeah. did you expect uh, to uh, possibly I was, win? I was kind of, you know, not really expecting it for whatever reason. Maybe I was just in some kind of denial and, um, <laughs> 
I remember going to a meeting in November after, and you know, the movie had come out, I think in June. And this producer said to me, you know, you, you guys might get a nomination or two. And I went, oh, okay, good. And then, but I was busy working on other stuff. Uh, I think I was working on What About Bob at the time. So just thoroughly immersed in that. And then I remember the phone ringing at like five o'clock in the morning and Stephen Haft, one of the producers, was whispering to me, he's going, oh, 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 wait, listen, listen, I'm going, Stephen, what's going on? He goes, shh, shh, shh. He goes, oh yeah, okay, you got nominated for best screenplay. Oh, oh okay, Robin got nominated. I said, what is this? He goes, it's the Oscars, you idiot. What do you think? <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, right. So I was kind of, I don't know where I was, but I was, I remember being shocked by it. But, uh, and then it was just, you know, you're kind of off to the races with parties and, you know, that kind of stuff for a while. And, uh, and, you know, the movie, I think it won the BAFTA award for best picture, but, but uh, when Harry Met Sally won best screenplay for BAFTA. So I just kind of thought, you know, it's not going to win, but it'll, it's great to be nominated. So uh, at the Oscars, I was still very shy. And I can remember saying, I don't want to go because uh, I don't <laughs> want, if, if God forbid I win, I'm going to have to get up there. I'm not doing that. My family said, you know, we're all coming out. You're going. Said, okay. So, um, you know, I was, I remember sitting there when they were finally reading off the category, you know, before they opened the envelope thinking, please don't let it be. I don't want to have to get up there. And then, <laughs> then it was me, you know, and, uh, and I as I was walking up onto the stage, somebody in the orchestra, a friend of mine's wife was in the orchestra pit, was one of the singers. And she said, Tom, Tom, Tom. And I'm looking down and I'm talking to her. Oh, Donna, nice to see you. What are you doing? <laughs> she goes, you better get up there. And I'm like, oh, right. <laughs> I was just in some very strange space. And then uh, uh, I got up and kind of babbled through a speech. I forgot to thank a couple people. Um, I, I, when I walked off, my presenter, Jane Fonda, said to me, what you just want an Oscar, you look like you, you know, you're having a heart attack. I said, I forgot to thank this person, I forgot to thank that person. She goes, Well, you just thank them next time. I thought, well, it's easy for you to say. But, uh, okay. So uh, we got it, we were at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion that year. So we got into an elevator and we rode down into the basement and they have this stage set up with these giant plastic Oscars. And you're standing on stage and there's a, some bleachers in front of you and the, the press is there. And the press, James walks me and says, this is Tom Shulman. He just won an Oscar. You know, any questions? Jane had just gotten kind of come back to Hollywood. She was with her, Ted Turner. So people going, Jane, what's it like, like life like with Ted? Jane, you know, what are you going to be doing with movies? Jane, Jane, she goes, wait, 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 wait. This is not about me. This is about Tom. Please direct your questions at Tom. So there's a pause and someone says, Tom, what's it like to get an Oscar from Jane? And Jane goes, all right, that's it. And she walked me off. And I just thought, you know, you kind of go from this high to very low right away, you know. And, and uh, you know, I got in an elevator, went up, snuck back into the audience with my statue and just, you know, there you are. And, and uh, so it was quite a strange little moment, but, but fun. I had my family there, you know, they, they went crazy and it was, that, it was great. Was there a ripple effect post Oscars? Did you start fielding more phone calls? Were more people wanting to have you uh, ride? I did not get off the phone for probably three weeks, literally. I mean, just I, when I got home, my answering machine was broken. It had like 300 messages and, wow. and all the ones after that, the, the dozen days with the tape, you know, so it ran yeah. out of tape. And um, I had to get on a plane, I think a week later and go... Uh, meet with Bill Murray about what about Bob so that was kind of the end of it for a while but I can remember just everywhere I went you know and you you know you just somebody wants to take you out to breakfast lunch and dinner for a year you know it's, it's <laughs> crazy <laughs> so uh, you just mentioned Bill Murray like you've worked with two comedic geniuses Bill Murray and Robin Williams you know need I say more yeah yeah what do you For remember sure. specifically about those guys working with them? Any similarities, any weird anecdotes? <laughs> no. Robin, certainly just a very sweet guy and a lovely guy to work with. And just, you know, um, um, couldn't have been, more, you know, sort of uh, 
more generous in a way about the way he dealt with everybody, you know, Bill less so, <laughs> you know, I think that's <laughs> all I can say, you know, but, but Bill is a genius. So it's, you know, you have to give everybody their right. quirks and so forth because of that. So. There was a very short turnaround on honey. I shrunk the kids and you know, had to do the script from a drama to a comedy in about a week. Uh, so yeah, how the hell did yeah. you pull it off? <sighs> That was just one of the most difficult weeks of my life, I think, in terms of just sleeplessness. You know, they, I think the script came to me on a Tuesday night and I read it and, you know, they said, this is, a, we need to make this into a comedy and I'm just, and we need to do it by a week from Sunday. I just thought, I, uh, no, no, I can't do this, you know, and my, my, my agents, my agent said, I've already said yes for you. You have to, you're starting tomorrow morning. So I said, oh, my God, you can't do this to me. He said, it's done. You know, just go talk to them and see what, you know. So I went over there to Disney and they said, yeah, it's got to be a comedy, blah, blah, blah. Start today. I said, guys, I have no idea what to do yet. I'll start on Monday. And they said, no, no, you can't start on Monday. This has to be in a pouch a week from Saturday to Rick Moranis in New York. And if Rick says, reads it and says he's still in the movie, we're making the movie. And if not, we don't know what we're going to do. We'll probably bang the movie. So you got to start today. And I said, well, I have to think about this. So they said, well, well, all right, let's let's screen the movie that inspired the original group. So we screen the Incredible Shrinking Man, which I'd seen before and is hardly a comedy, <laughs> existential drama, basically. Um, and then we, I went and saw all the, the uh storyboards they'd done for the the various action sequences the bee chase and so forth and uh, and then they basically said so you're on your own and uh I'm like oh my god but they had uh, a duo named uh, ray gideon and uh, bruce evans on as producers at that time who were uh brilliant guys and ray said to me you know just remember to think about what it was like to be that age and what it would be like if this happened, you know, just, just, just personalize it. And I said, okay. So I started remembering that when I was in a senior in high school, I broke my leg and uh, the doctor came, I, there was going to be a, I had a, a, a hot date that weekend. And I remember the doctor coming in and saying, you know, you're going to probably be in traction for three or four weeks, maybe a couple of months. It was a bad break. <clears throat> and all I cared about was that I wasn't going to be able to go out on that date that weekend. And that's, that gave me the, <clears throat> the end to the story, which was these kids have been shrunk, but they're all they care about is the stuff they cared about, you know, before Amy, the main character wants to go, she's got a, she's got the hots for this guy. And then, you know, she just <clears throat> wants to get big again so she can do that. So that kind of gave me the, the angle I needed to start working on it. And it felt like a kind of comedic angle. So, and, and uh, so on Monday, all weekend, those guys calling me start now, start now, start now. And I said, no, starting Monday. So Monday morning I got up and I think for the first time in years had writers, I just couldn't sit there paralyzed. And my wife said to me, don't write the first scene, write the second scene. I said, okay. So I started doing that and five minutes into that, <clears throat> jumped back into the first scene and then just, wrote, uh, you know, 50 pages a day for every day, basically, just 50 pages, turn it in, work on the next 50 pages, turn it in, rewrite the first 50 pages, turn it in, you know, it was just insane, insane. So, you know, 22 hours a day, uh, catnap sleeping, you know, horrifying, and uh, not knowing whether I was coming or going, meeting with the director and the and Gideon and Evans and talking through this and talking through that. And, Saturday morning, they said, took it out of my hands and sent it to Rick Moranis. I've completely forgot about that. Just they took it away. And Sunday afternoon, I was sound asleep. And my wife said, Rick Moranis is on the phone. And I said, Oh, my God. And I'm like, oh God, Rick, Rowe, no. So I pick up the phone and he goes, I love it. Thank you. And that was it. And so it was just like, what an experience, you know? Yeah, that's. Uh, Oh, wow. That's almost crazier <laughs> than the Dead Poet Society, you know, under the circumstances. Yeah, yeah just, just nuts. But, uh, but satisfying in the end, you know, because you're just, you're up against the wall and you're either, you know, going to figure it out or not. So, um, so you wrote I guess, the best family comedies in six days. 
Well, I had the the basic, you know, it was a rewrite. So right, the yeah. structure was there. And uh, so, you know, I don't want to take all the credit by any stretch, but uh, the, you know, they, they, uh, I think they were bouncing back and forth between how much comedy, how much drama to have. Mm -hmm. So they weren't focused on, on doing that as much as the studio wanted them to. So, uh, and I think what I heard had happened was the team that, that was doing the movie had decided to do all the special effects sort of analog so that the bee would be a man in a bee suit. The ant would be a person in an ant suit. So Disney had them shoot some tests of that. And when they saw it, they just said, you're done. We're, <laughs> we're in big trouble. This doesn't work at all. So that's how, that's what happened to them. So uh, what, what is the typical writer director relationship like on the set? Does the director usually ask the writer for input? Is there a back and forth? Do you ever say, Hey, that's not really what I had in mind or anything like that? Typically the writer's not on the set. You know, it's pretty unusual for, I mean, Peter Weir said, I want you on the set and, you know, and if you want to direct, you know, I've done eight movies. If, you know, pick up anything, you ask me any questions and so forth and I can be of any help, which is just amazing. I, you know, I haven't had a director that generous since. Um, so, uh, but, you know, in Hollywood, typically, I think, uh, and I don't have any stats on this, but I, I think most of the time the writer is not on the set. Um, if the writer's on the set, you know, I mean, Peter would say to me, feel free to just make any comments that you want to make after the, after a take. And I remember <laughs> after like the second take, I tapped him on the shoulder and I'm going, he goes, do me a favor, just count to 10 before you say anything. And then, then you can say whatever you want. And I got, I said, oh my God, well, I'll just go home. And he goes, no, 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 don't get your feelings hurt. Just, <laughs> just, just give me 10 seconds to have my own thoughts and then we can talk about it. I said, okay. So he was incredibly generous that way, you know, and, uh, right. and we would go at the end of each day, we'd go back to his little office trailer and talk about everything that was done and what stuff we might need to tweak or change or whatnot. He was, he was amazing. Great. So yeah. from the outside looking in, it feels like writers face a lot of opposition. You know, there's so many management levels you have to navigate people who have Absolutely. to prove this and that. So how do you work through all these things while attempting to try to maintain the integrity of your baby? You know, at that stage in my career, I did not know enough to be politic. So I would fight everything that I thought was wrong. I would just say, no, nah, nah, you know, and I, and I would be nice about it, but I would go, oh, I don't think this, that's not a good idea. And for some reason, people kept me around, you know, but, uh, later, I, you know, I've been told by a lot of people and I started to feel it myself, like, hey, just, you know, choose your battles, that, those kinds of things. And I, I still think in the end, it's better to just, you know, if you feel like something's going in the wrong direction, say so. If you feel like that line's not a good line, say so. If you're not sure, say, I don't know, I'm not sure. Don't cave in and let your, you know, and, and, and try to be open. I'm always feeling like I want to hear a better idea than I think I put right. on the page or than I have. That's great. But, uh, but if something hits me and strikes me, feels wrong, you know, I'm just going to say so. And I think, I think that's what writers need to do and uh, probably get a lot of people fired if they <laughs> follow that advice. <laughs> well, well said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, who are some of your personal favorite authors? Um, screenwriters. Uh, yes, Alan, right. Alvin Sargent, Bill Goldman, you know, uh, the, the, all the guys that collaborated with Kurosawa, um, you know, just, uh, um, uh, Robert Riskin, who wrote some of what they call the Capra films, um, uh, Coppola, um, uh, John Milius, uh, Robert Town, you know, the, the people that wrote the, the, the brothers that wrote Casablanca, uh, the Epstein brothers, um, more favorite scripts than favorite writers. I think, you know, we all have a few good ones in us maybe. And some people obviously have, have a lot of those <laughs> Goldman being one, Alvin Sargent being another. Um, so to date, what is the best piece of writing advice that you've received in your life? Whew. Um, I would say it's something that I heard from Robert Town, which is 
you know, fully explore the world of your story. You know, know it like, you know, like other people know. I mean, you are the, you need to be the expert in that world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how much research you have to do really depends on how much you know already, but, you know, really, really have that. So there's a kind of immersion that goes on so that you know what's what's right or wrong for in every situation with every character. Great. So let's say you're sitting down for the evening to watch your favorite films. What's on the lineup? Um, you know, I mean, The Godfather is always, no matter where <laughs> I, if I flip a channel and it's, it's on, I'm instantly riveted, you know, and it's as if it's so strange to watch a movie so many times and, and, you know, knowing exactly what's going to happen and yet <laughs> still be completely riveted. Um, you know, King's Speech recently, which is not that recent, love that. Um, uh, oh God, it's my, I'd have to, I mean, there's thousands of movies that I love. Uh, Groundhog Day. Um, Good choice. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, strangely enough, the movie Pi, Darren Aronofsky's movie, sticks, <laughs> sticks with me. Um, uh, it's kind of such a brilliant kind of merger of low budget, you know, what, what resources he had with, mm -hmm. with a story, you know, to, to that place where the, the limitations actually made the movie better. I thought that was an extraordinary thing. Uh, I'm jealous of that. I keep looking for something like that. Um, Oh, I'd have to look at a list. I can change the <laughs> Sounds like us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I love Chinatown. I, you know, um, a lot of thrillers, you know, but uh, yeah, I'd have to look at a list. <laughs> and when you're writing, um, and a character starts to to come to life, do you do you have a particular actor or a particular voice or, or person in mind? I usually populate it with someone that I know, you know, so as mm -hmm. the voice emerges, somehow a picture of that person and I go, oh, this is like my friend Jack. That's who this mm -hmm. is, you know, or whatever. And uh, What About Bob is the only movie where uh, I was told because uh, Alvin Sargent, one of the producers, also a writer, the, I think a few weeks after I took the job, the Writers Guild went on strike for five months. So oh. we decided, you know, we're not going to, no writing, but we can talk about it and just talk about it in the most general terms without talking about any story or anything like that, like casting or things like that. And I remember Alvin Sargent saying to me, you know, I think that, that Bill Murray guy would be a good <laughs> model for Bob. And as soon as he said that, I just went, yeah. So he's the only movie star I had in mind for it. And, uh, and then we were lucky enough to get it. <laughs> I'll say, uh, what was the most jarring aspect for you jumping from screenwriting to directing? The exhaustion of it. And, you know, it was like, honey, I shrunk the kids every day for six weeks, <sighs> you know, once you start shooting and you're, you're kind of playing chess with, with, with the gods, you know, cause you go out to shoot a, a sunny shot in the desert and it's pouring down rain and 50 mile an hour winds. And what are you going to do? You know, you lose that day or you lose half a day and then you never, you never get back to shoot that stuff. And now the universe is rewriting your story because it's, you know, the, that story is, a, is a, a, you know, everything in that story connects to everything else and you lose one connection and suddenly it's, uh Oh, so, it was that way all the time or an actor is late or somebody's sick or it's just, uh, and so this constant sense of just rush, 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 no time to really enjoy the shot. It's just get the shot as fast as you can and get on to the next shot and try to make your day. So um, it's, I remember when I was, uh, I had a driver who would pick me up because I would have died from exhaustion driving on the, on the highway. And as we were riding out to the set every day, these vans of people from outward bound would pass us. They were going up into the mountains with these kids, you know, and I just thought, God, I'd love to be on those vans. Oh my God. Instead of going to shoot this movie, <laughs> but 
And so it got to the certain point where like a prisoner, you've got a calendar on the wall and you're just Xing off every day. And you're so tired, you you know, you don't really care anymore how the movie turns out. I mean, you do, but you're just, I, you, I got maybe three and a half, four hours of sleep a night for six weeks. And after a while, it just scares you. You're just going, I'm going to, you know, I may die from lack of sleep. And you try to sleep longer, but you know, all the problems of the next day or the last day or whatever are just floating through your mind and you can't turn it off. So it's, I mean, I had enough time to sleep, but not enough, you know, peace right. to sleep. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I can imagine going from, you know, writing, that's very personal. You, you only rely on yourself. And not only are you the director and everybody's asking you questions, you also have to manage all of the actors and all the personalities. And, you know, this guy wants Brown in my names and, well, you know, right, whatever. right, right. TV. I didn't mind that, you know, I didn't, I mean, I, I had, a, you know, some people, I remember somebody on an airplane saying to me, oh, you, you wrote this, do, do you, do you know, do you see like the, the rooms or the people? And I'm like, you know, I didn't want to say it, but of course you see the rooms. <laughs> I mean, you see the whole thing. It may change when they make the movie, but you have a vision in your mind of what the room looks like and what the people look like and what they're wearing. So when you're directing one, you you know the answers to the questions you know i mean people may come up with better ideas but at least you can right. engage in the dialogue without being people can ask you 50 questions and you can answer them but it's just and so prep was not so hard for me but getting to the shooting and just the pace of which we had to do things was you know daunting and <laughs> no fun no fun so well, we've touched on Bill Murray and Robin Williams, but you've also worked with Joe Pesci. So what right, was, what was right. your experience like with Joe? Was Joe is, Joe uh, is that guy from, <laughs> from Goodfellas, you know, that's, that's, that's who he is. So, uh, uh, you know, we started out, it was really rocky for a while. And then, you know, I think he was upset because we had, you know, we were moving at a fast pace and so forth and so on. And then, you know, we kind of reached a, 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 a nice, place with each other I think by the time it ended but uh, I mean I, I remember Joe being you know he was very dyspepsic very grumbly and then one day my mother came to the set and he was just a completely different person when he, around my mother <laughs> it's just that you know kind of Italian thing with the mother yeah. and it was just I thought god if I just brought my mother to the set every day I think things would have been much better <laughs> but uh so it was difficult, but it was, you know, ultimately he was, we, we had a good time and, and he did it, you know, so I was right. always great, grateful for that. Well, Tom, we're not going to hold you hostage all night. I guess I'll just ask you, like, do you have anything on the horizon, anything in the works? What's yeah, the yeah, yeah. I'm working on like four things at once, you know, it's, we're in the land of COVID. So it's, I don't, uh, one project I have with a couple other writers and a, producer is sort of you know sitting waiting to go but we're not gonna nobody's gonna we're not gonna make it studio is not gonna make it until COVID is you know till it's cheaper frankly and less mm -hmm. less you know I, I think the studios care about human life but I know they care about money so yeah. the the cost of doing things these days with with COVID is is pretty high so and I've got a um an indie movie that I wrote and I'm gonna direct that I've got some financing for which sort of got you know, waylaid by COVID. So I'm trying to hold that together until, um, until it's done. And then, you know, until, until the virus is over and we can make it. So I'm excited about that. <coughs> excited about both of those. And then I'm writing two other things right now while, you know, there's nothing else to do. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Angelique, do you have anything for Tom before we cut him loose here? I, I do have my, my one final question. <laughs> sure. So, you know, um, what's your go-to movie snack? So, like, what's that one munchie you got to have just to make that perfect movie watching experience? Oh, my God. Well, it's popcorn. Oh, you right. Know, that's I mean, I just, that's just been, I cannot watch a movie without a bag of popcorn, you know, it just, uh, <clears throat> and I went through a period where popcorn started upsetting my stomach. And then I'm just like, no, sorry, I'm going to have to live with an upset stomach because I can't watch the movie <laughs> without popcorn. So uh, what's yours? Oh, gosh. Um, I like pizza. Oh, wow. Sure. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's my new one. Pizza. There we go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> to me, that's that's a home food for TV. You know, in the theater, it's it's the popcorn, and I'll pick a theater based on how good their popcorn is. You know, if we if there's four two places to go, I'll drive an extra twenty minutes just because they have good popcorn. So. Yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah, in yeah. the theater, it's definitely popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As someone sacrilegious, I'm not I'm not a fan of popcorn. Oh really? Wow! Yeah, I know. I've... And I talked to you for all this time. Oh, my <laughs> no, God. That's why I wait till the end. I always wait till the <laughs> right. end for that revelation. We're done. It's it's too late. Now. Over. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Tom, it's been great talking to you. We're gonna cut you loose here, and okay, it's been a pleasure. All right, man. It was great to meet okay. you. Have a great night, man. Ditto. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Now. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.